Welcome friends to another 40k video. Today we draw on Xenology by Simon Spurrier and look at accounts in that book in relation to the Crout. This first one is a report delivered by the Officio Assassinorum and it's the Calidus Shrine. This is what they have discovered about the Crout. We arrived at Petch on the 17th day. The surface is a tropical jungle teeming with life though it rapidly becomes obvious that every organism shares a common heritage, beaks, claws, quills, feathers, tiny eyes and hunched spines. Such things are evidenced everywhere, from bug-like scavengers to aerial predators, and not least the crude themselves. My first encounters with this supposedly barbarous race were uniformly impressive, they are an athletic species that move with sudden bursts of motion, staying perfectly still at all other times. Several, most notably the Shaper, who is in the role of a chieftain or warlord, spoke low Gothic very well, holding beaks open and forming words deep in their throats. Their own language is a series of clicks, rasps and whistles, which become quickly irritating, accompanied as it is by manipulations of their high quill crests which rattle and rustle most off-puttingly. They live in strange interconnected chambers made of steel and wood strung a bit below the canopy and there seems no sense of personal ownership. From the outset they treated me differently to the other crewmen. I suspect they could smell the polymorphine and were intrigued by the facade. I was given a tour of the ancestral hunting grounds and invited to a gather meal. Despite my displeasure at the company of Xenos, I could hardly refuse without drawing suspicion. Native eating habits are not for the squeamish, with different portions of different meats, all raw, divided amongst the kindred by the shaper. The sounds of frenzied guzzling were nauseating. Evidently, the creatures believe the qualities of their prey can be transferred. Thus, a female considered clumsy was fed the flesh of an elegant twig-stepping predator and a juvenile treated to a sliver of pickled tissue from a dead elder. Whether the benefits of such superstitions are supposed to occur immediately or upon a purely generational level is something none of my queries could satisfy. One other detail sticks in my mind. The day before we resumed our journey, I was shown to a forest thicket by an elderly female. She called it the kindred's sacred egg, though to me the misshapen lump of metal within had nothing to suggest wholeness. She explained such artefacts had been scattered across Petch as long as any kindred could remember, and Laura asserted that ancient secrets lay within. I was naturally mystified, though it struck me that, despite the war spheres in orbit, I have seeing almost nothing of crude technology. It was only at the female's insisting gesturing that I noticed a holy glyph on the molten lump, a crude horned skull with a vast lower jaw, another enigma. Next is a note of a Magos biologist who says that psychers produce far higher concentrations of immunocells than normal humans. And then we are told that a crude consumed the psychic's flesh and that the crew's arterial networks are almost saturated with these copies of human cellular fortification. The implications are shattering. The crew has stolen a blueprint of the psychic's natural defences. Given time, would he have developed psychic talents himself or at least passed them to his offspring? Was his brain tissue changing its very structure during his final days? We shall never know. His cerebral matter was utterly destroyed during death and he takes this miracle to the grave with him. Who's in a section talking to us about the digestion that a croot does? And I'll go over that now in a briefer way. First we're told that when a croot eats something, what they take from that can either affect their mind or their body. And then we... Going over similar ground, are told how offspring will inevitably reflect the flesh choices of their parents, i.e. what they eat, something is carried on in that next generation. And we're told that it takes, or it's estimated that it takes just three generations for a crew to become an entirely distinct species from their ancestors. 
And it's speculated that in the prehistory of the Kroot, one of the life forms on Petch, the planet that where they started, developed this ability and that it was passed on to the Kroot over time. We're told that an orc ship crashed on Petch. And it suggested that through eating the orc's flesh, the Kroot gradually began to change so that they took on a orc elder human style body. And that this would seem to explain the presence of stellar debris upon perch and the existence of fungal fluids within Kroot pulmonary systems. The Inquisitor also makes a note that the Kroot have always propagated a primitive culture based upon hunting, fighting, wealth and honour. How, then, with such casual success, have they fabricated their war spheres? And it goes on to say, the Kroot possess the means to tap into the algal information contained within Arcoid DNA, just like the mech boys whose data they'd stolen. From that, they intuitively constructed spacefaring vehicles without conscious thought. In short, the neural digestive system was the crew's key to unlocking their place in the galaxy. And that, friends, is where I will end today's video. A lot of interesting bits of crew lore there. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one.